In 1997, Darlie Lynn Routier was sentenced to death for the murder of her five-year-old son, Damon. She has also been accused of, but not tried for, the murder of her other son, Devon. I've been wrongfully convicted. I'm innocent. Uh, I've been done wrong. Wrong for the innocent, the wrongly accused! Years after the murders, the case still sparks controversy. There are no gray areas. Some believe she did it, some are equally adamant that she didn't. I think he, even the 12 jurors in Kerr County would have uh, found her not guilty if they'd heard all the evidence. She is a cold-blooded killer. The Routier story began in the early morning hours of June 6, 1996, in their home in Rowlett, a suburb of Dallas. Her husband, Darren Routier, had been asleep upstairs with their seven-month-old son, Drake. Since his birth, Darley had been having trouble sleeping when he cried at night. So when the boys, Damon and Devon, decided to sleep downstairs, she stayed with them. Then, at 2.30 a.m., all hell broke loose. First thing I hear is this real light glass break. The next thing I hear is Dolly screaming. I mean, screaming as loud as any person you've ever heard. I ran downstairs. And as soon as I get to the edge of the stairs, I mean, Dolly's just freaking. I mean, she's Devin, 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 Devin. I mean, she's just going off and just saying it a million times in a row. Oh, my God! Oh, my God! Oh, my God! I get downstairs and run right straight over to Devin, and he's laying face up, and he's got this look on his face of nothing. He has these two huge gashes in his chest. Devin had been stabbed while sleeping. I tried to revive him, I gave him CPR, I blew into his mouth. As soon as I blew into his mouth, blood came out of his chest. And it was just a complete hole. And I put my hands over it, trying to hold the holes closed. And then I look up and Damon's laying over 12 feet away from him, up against the floor. And he's just laying there and he's not, you know, he's moving a little bit. Darren Routier was so intent on trying to save first Devon and then Damon, that he didn't even realize his own wife's throat had been slashed and she was bleeding profusely. And I saw the blood everywhere. I mean, you look at the crime scene photos and, and, you know, in evidence, the carpet is blood red from one end to the house to the other. And all, mostly all of Darley's. I mean, Darley almost bled to death. When the paramedics arrived, they found six and a half year old Devon dead and five year old Damon barely clinging to life. We believe he was stabbed laying down and he was stabbed in the back. That's the younger of the two of them, okay? He, he obviously gets up and puts his hand on his mommy. That's how Darley says she wakes up. In her written statement to police, Darley said she was asleep on the couch when she heard Damon cry. She also said, quote, there was a man standing down at my feet, walking away from me. The Rowlett police descended on the house. Darley Key remembers that scene outside her daughter's home. I mean, there were probably 30 or 40 people around, and there were lights and stuff on the house, and the yellow tape was going up, and there were police officers running in and out of the house. Contaminating everything, all the evidence on the floor, adding footprints to it, smashing blood spots on the floor. Police scoured the area and found no intruder. What they did find was a cut window screen in the garage a sock with blood drops on it in the alley, and inside on the kitchen counter, a bloody knife. Darley said she picked up the knife after finding it in the utility room, but nothing was stolen. Even the jewelry Darley had left on the kitchen counter was still there, intact. People were very afraid that this person was just prowling around the streets of the town and was going to strike again. The Rowlett police, unaccustomed to dealing with murders like this, brought in James Cron, a retired Dallas investigator, to examine the crime scene. I noticed the blood, or lack of blood in some cases. There was a lack of evidence connecting a suspect to this. All we had was a scene and victims, and therefore one of the victims became the suspect. We didn't start looking at the mother till uh, 20, 30 minutes in when I told him, I said, something's wrong with this scene. Five-year-old Damon Routier died on the way to the hospital. And as Darley was rushed into surgery, Investigators were already zeroing in on a suspect. 
We're convinced it wasn't just a random act. No one is being ruled in or out as suspects. When we come back, just who is Darley Routier? Stay off the grass. Everything's changed. What I had was an utopia compared to what my life is like with now. The Routiers had lost two sons within a few hours. We couldn't believe what was happening. You know, that our babies were murdered, that I was left for dead. You know, who would do this? Why would somebody do this? Um, you know, you have so many questions. The Rowlett police had many questions as well. And soon after her surgery, Darley was interviewed. From the onset, the Routiers cooperated fully. By the morning of June 6th, news of the murders had spread throughout Rowlett, a community of 40,000. And it's like everybody else around here, you just, it just seems safe enough. You know, as long as your door's locked, you're fine. I mean, apparently not. Most people who live here work someplace else, usually in Dallas. Uh, it's a fairly affluent town, uh, a fairly young town as well. The median income is somewhere around 65,000. Um, most people are in their 30s or 40s. In comparison, the Routiers were young, only in their mid-20s, but apparently affluent. She was 15 when she met Darren. I introduced them at the Western Sizzlin Steakhouse where I worked with Darren. It was Mother's Day, I believe, of 1985, I think. And um, she walked in with me, and that was it. Darren was smitten. In 1988, they were married. Darley was 18, Darren just 20. I was living um, what a lot of people can only hope to live. You know, I'm very fortunate. I felt very blessed. Um, had a wonderful, happy home. Three little, healthy, happy boys. Um, good marriage. You know, we were happy. Darren ran his own business, making circuit boards for computers. The family lived in a quarter of a million dollar home, had expensive cars, a boat on a nearby lake, and Darley was always fashionably dressed and jeweled. In 1989, Devon was born, followed by Damon two years later. Then, Drake in 1995. Baby Jake, I'm going to get you. She's one of the most awesome mothers you've ever seen. She's the one that goes to the PTA meetings and makes all these little, we stayed up all night one night before Easter, making these little bitty Easter eggs with bunny ears and all that stuff with hot glue and, you know, that's the way she is. I mean, she's the type of mother that gets down on the floor and wrestles with the boys. What's your name? Devin. Devin what? Devin Musketeer. Devin was the happy-go-lucky, center of attention type kid. You know, loved to uh, make you laugh. Very smart. Walked me out. I mean, I went to electronics school and he taught me how to use Windows 95 at five years old. Damon, can you do a flip? No. What can you do? Damon was quiet. He didn't talk very much. Very, you know, kind and very kind of soft. You know, not rough. Not a rough little boy. Before the murders, Darley and Darren had made future plans. They wanted to renew their wedding vows, go on vacation. But their first priority was a seventh birthday party for Devon, and invitations had already been sent. Happy birthday to you. But the celebration took place here at the boys' graveside, just eight days after the murder, and this is what it looked like when it hit the air in Dallas. Happy birthday, dear Devin. Instead of a grief-stricken mother, it showed a smiling, gum-chewing Darley, dressed in shorts, spraying silly string onto her child's grave. I couldn't fathom a grieving mother standing out there laughing, uh, parading around on these graves, shooting silly string. It, it, it just repulsed me as a parent, I have to tell you that. Love you, Devin and Dana. Most people couldn't understand how a mother could act like this, but the routiers vehemently defend that graveside celebration. That whole scenario, we're not sorry for. We would do it again. The reason why it was done is out of honor for them, and honor for Devin. That birthday party was done out of complete love, unselfish 
love, nothing but pure love done for him because he wanted to be seven. Even so, the silly string tape would prove to be a big mistake. I don't believe bad taste equates to criminal responsibility. But that wasn't the only video being recorded that day. Unbeknownst to anyone, police had set up a video surveillance camera at the gravesite. And on the tape, you can see what transpired before the birthday celebration. Prior to that birthday party celebration, there was a two-hour memorial service with all the appropriate uh, uh, sermons, crying, hugs and sobs among the family and friends that were there. And police also recorded Darley's sister Dana at the grave. It was her idea to bring Silly String. I got you some snaps from Silly String. Then, later on, she and Darley returned to the cemetery. Are we allowed to do this? The routiers believed that while they were grieving, the police were out looking for the intruder. A strange black car had been seen several times in the neighborhood. They had hundreds of leads and had people calling in and there was, you know, a neighbor across the street saw the black car, saw the black car, you know, uh, plenty of neighbors saw a black car, but without a license plate number, what do you got? What the police had was this, a blood trail that ended in the utility room that connects to the garage. There was also a cut window screen and a sock with drops of blood on it, left by a sewer drain in the alley behind the house. For a crime so bloody and vicious, police believe there should have been much more evidence of a disturbance. And then there were Darley's statements about the intruder. They were just not adding up. The original story on the 911 tape was that she woke up and she began fighting with the man at the couch. When the officers come to the scene, she says that she woke up, she chased this man and fought with him in the kitchen. So you see, now we have a progression to the fact that she woke up and she saw a man walking away from her with no struggle. Police called the routiers back in for more questioning. My dad kind of thought after four or five interviews with the police that, you know, they, something's not right here. And he talked to Darley and Darren and they both said, you know, innocent people don't need attorneys. What police were doing was gathering evidence, enough to pin the murders on Darley. On June 18th, Darley Lynn Routier was arrested for the murders of her sons, Damon and Devon. We believe that the white male suspect described by Darley Routier as the man that attacked her and murdered her children never existed. We also believe that the wounds present on Darley Routier were self-inflicted. As for the father, Darren Routier, at this point we do not believe that he was involved in or participated in the murders. I saw Darlene arrested on TV. I had no idea. We had no idea. Coming up, Darley on trial. I'm innocent. This was not an investigation as much as an evidence collection process focusing simply on Darley routine. Ooh, pretty. Let me see the other one. You keep thinking that, you know, you're innocent and you know you keep waiting for them to come back and tell you that oh well, we've made a terrible mistake and we're so sorry and you know we found who did this but it was not like that at all in fact it was beginning to look more like the susan smith case comes to texas fox 4 tv reporter jeff Crilly remembers the media frenzy oh it was huge uh Everybody thought, wow, we have a, a Susan Smith right here in our own backyard. Uh, a, a mother, uh, well-to-do, lived in a, an affluent neighborhood in a, in a nice suburb, and she killed her own kids. I mean, it was, it was so big that uh, we couldn't do enough Darley stories. What do you think happened that night? I think that we had the prettiest house on the block, and I think that I had the prettiest wife on the block. And I believe that someone decided to follow her home from the grocery store, follow her home from the tanning salon. I don't know. Darley's arrest sent the Routier family reeling. In the midst of grieving for Damon and Devon, they now had to focus totally on Darley's arrest. We were crying all the time. We were just, you know, couldn't even get off the couch. I mean, we were just, you know, we were devastated. 
Child Protective Services took seven-month-old Drake into their custody, but Darren's parents, Cyrilda and Leonard Routier, filed for and won temporary custody. What's the first thing you're going to tell her to do with your grandchild? I'm going to kiss him. With Darley behind bars, the district attorney's office began building their strategy. There were very calculated efforts made throughout this crime to try to divert attention, to try to mislead the police. To this day, the sequence of events is unclear. But the state argued that Darley had not only murdered her children, but before slashing her own throat, put the murder weapon in the utility room, cut the garage screen window, and put the sock in the alley. Prosecutors claimed Darley planned it all, hoping to make it appear an intruder had been in the house. Why would someone take a sock out of the home? You mean to tell me they're going to leave a murder weapon behind with their fingerprints perhaps on it and they're going to take a sock down an alleyway? I don't think the Rudiers, either one of them, would have been sophisticated enough to plant something down the, down the alley near a trash uh, uh, receptacle. Um, I think that's more consistent with someone discarding something as he flees. Just three months before the trial, Dallas attorney Doug Mulder replaced Darley's court-appointed attorneys. By that time, it had been decided to try the case in Kerrville. It makes absolutely no sense to me to move a case from an area of 2 million to an area of 20,000 on the basis of publicity. I mean, it's, it's absurd. Um, so, and, and the first thing I tried to do when I uh, got into the case was move it back to Dallas. But uh, Judge Toll wasn't, uh, wasn't about to move it. Located 60 miles west of San Antonio in the high country, Kerrville drastically differs from Dallas and is known for being conservative. The prosecution sought the death penalty. Under Texas law, Damon Routier's murder is considered a capital offense because he was under six years of age. On January 6, 1997, the trial began. She came into the courtroom. She had this kind of smug look on her face. Uh, the, the police uh, described her as uh, a woman who was living in the fast lane, uh, that she and her husband had uh, accumulated some debt. And um, so she was, she was despised. I mean, people hated her. No television cameras were permitted inside the courtroom. But each day, it was filled to capacity. Prosecutors said the Routiers had severe financial problems that prevented Darley from living the high life. Bank statements revealed that the Routiers had less than $2,500 in their account the day of the murders and were behind on mortgage payments. They could not believe the opening statements from Greg Davis. She killed her children because she was tired of her lifestyle? Give me a break, she lived for those children. Everything about her life was her family. There was financial pressure there because of her level of spending. Their income was leveling off. That's one thing. We know, too, that she was depressed. She's unhappy uh, following the birth of her third son. Uh, in fact, she's attempted to commit suicide a month earlier in her home, according to her own journal. So she's unhappy. Indeed, Routier's journal does say she cannot go on and hopes that Devin, Damon, and Drake will forgive her. But Darren Routier insists his wife was not suicidal. I mean, just because a woman has baby blues doesn't mean she's going to kill her children. And Routier absolutely denies having financial problems. I had $26,000 on my books. But you were, did you have financial problems at that time? No, I didn't. The wounds that she had suffered were dramatically different than the wounds that the children had suffered. You have to remember their wounds were deep penetrating stab wounds to the chest area and to the back, to the torso. Hers, on the other hand, are slashes, cuts to the extremities and to the neck area. The defense argued that Darley was right-handed, and in order to slash her own neck and stab her right arm, she would have had to change hands. I don't believe that Darley Rudier would, uh, uh, you know, had the presence of mind to, to do that. Up on the witness stand, crime scene investigator James Cron emphatically stated that no intruder ever entered the house. I think Mr. Cron missed his calling. Uh, what, what he should be is a psychic reader. He was out there 20 minutes on the scene and he's already solved the case. Doesn't have a fingerprint, hadn't talked to anybody, hadn't seen any of the evidence. Lab tests revealed that another kitchen knife contained fibers from the window screen that had been cut. 
and that the bloody fingerprints throughout the house belonged only to Darley, Damon, and Devon, and not anyone else. The defense accused police of contaminating the scene and not preserving the evidence. Obviously, when you take some bloody clothing that's still wet with blood and you stuff it into a uh, paper sack, you uh, uh, certainly risk the possibility of transferring blood stains from one location in the shirt to another. FBI profiler Alan Brantley, who examined the crime scene photos and other reports, testified for the state. The major contradiction starting out was you have an absolute maximum of human devastation and loss of life, these two young children, and you have an absolute minimum of property damage. It was almost like the offender was very careful not to disturb or damage the personal property that he found or encountered in his home. There are probably many people in this country who would be scared to death uh, of having the FBI come down and start testifying that someone is statistically guilty. Brantley believed that for this type of crime, there would have been much more chaos inside the home than just an overturned vacuum cleaner and a broken wine glass. For someone to have hit that wine rack with sufficient force to cause that glass to be dislodged, you should have dislodged another other items that were even more fragile and lighter on that wine rack. And the outside was also too orderly. The gate was shut, and the windowsill and the mulch on the ground were undisturbed. The mulch outside the yard wasn't disturbed. Well, beneath the window was concrete. There's no mulch to be disturbed. Lloyd Harrell was the investigator for the defense. He says there's no way that crime scene was staged. She never said I had a violent confrontation, that the vacuum cleaner was overthrown, that the glass was broken. So why would somebody invent a story, set a stage, and then not use it? But the crime scene wasn't the only weapon the prosecution used. Darley's behavior was on trial as well. They questioned whether she really cared about her children at all. Julie Clark, Darley's good friend, testified in her defense. She was a very supportive mother of her children. Everything she did, she geared toward her children in her life. And the prosecution said the 911 call revealed that Darley had other things on her mind aside from her dying children. They point to her phone call. They say that that's not something who, somebody would say if they just lost their kids, that you, you wouldn't be thinking along those lines. On the stand, the first officer at the crime scene reported that even after telling Darley to help Damon, she never went to him. Instead, she stayed on the phone with 911. But Darley's written statement contradicts that. And there's another contradiction. Notes taken at Baylor Hospital describe Darley as tearful, frightened, and sobbing uncontrollably. But when the nurses testified at trial, they changed their story, saying Darley never grieved or cried for her children. The defense says the nurses were coached before their testimony. They had a brainstorming session with the Baylor nurses out at the Wild Hilton, uh, the Holiday Inn, to discuss the, the bruising and the pictures and, and talk about it, discuss it. Uh, you make your own mind up. It certainly uh, uh, eliminates candor. Outside the courtroom, both sides played to the media, and sometimes it got nasty. Well, I think it, sh it says that there was no intruder, period. It's a lie, and you know it. Do I have to interview in front of this trailer trash over here? Hey, don't even start. I'm sure. You were never in that house. You don't know that family. You don't know anything about it. You come down here, it's a political move. Next, Darley takes the stand. Happy birthday to you. How damaging was that silly string tape? I think that was the key. I think that was the key to the prosecutor's case. And Greg Davis, the prosecutor, he knew that that was his ringer. Should have never even been admitted into court. Had nothing to do with the crime. The jury did see the silly string tape, but not the police surveillance tape. That's because, amazingly, the defense never asked for it to be admitted into evidence. It was more important to stress that the police, by videotaping surreptitiously, had violated a federal law against wiretapping. When questioned on the stand about the taping, detectives took the fifth. They did not want to incriminate themselves. The entire ability to attack the state's case through normally the best witnesses, which the investigators were denied the defense. And then Darley took the stand, and her testimony was devastating to her defense. 
she is not sympathetic, and when she took the stand, she was a terrible witness. She wasn't sure at trial whether she was awake or asleep when she got stabbed. She wasn't sure whether she was awake or asleep when she was supposedly beaten by this intruder. She couldn't explain how she could sleep through the attack of these two children when one of them is one foot away from her. All of that occurred on direct examination by Mr. Mulder. And Darley did not come across, uh, did not make as good a witness as I had hoped she would. The defense was caught off guard when prosecutors presented Darley with letters she had written to friends from prison. In them, she wrote she knew who murdered her boys. That was quite a different story, since up until that moment, Darley claimed she never knew the intruder. When confronted with the letters, she dissolved into tears. In cross-examination, the defense explained the letters by saying that Darley was only repeating what she had heard from others. But it was too late. The only time we saw genuine tears were when she was caught in some lies. And that's when we saw the true fear. It was fear for herself because she realized, she realized what a fix she's in there. Despite her testimony, Darley and the defense remained optimistic. After four weeks, the jury adjourned and deliberated for just seven hours. They returned with a guilty verdict. They've admitted having watched that tape seven, eight, nine times. And that was just purely inflammatory evidence. It is based on an eye, the, the whole theory of its relevance is that someone can look at, at a video of somebody 10 days after this horrific event and tell whether they're a killer or not. She was a, a so-called uh, light sleeper. In other words, she woke up in the evenings when her baby son moved around in the crib, but she didn't wake up when her two boys were being stabbed within feet away from her. Mm -mm, no. She, she would have heard that. There was very little remorse. I mean, she, she hardly ever cried. But it was far from over. Next came the punishment phase. And I backed him. I said, you have made the wrong decision, but you don't have to compound it by giving her death. You know, uh, something has gone really seriously wrong here. And please, just please give us time to find out what really happened. The jury returned with the death sentence. I knew that they would give her the death penalty. That's what they were there for. That's what you find out about death penalty cases, is that in order to be on a death penalty jury, you have to believe in the death penalty. And in Texas, there is no such thing as life without parole. So the death penalty is the only guarantee that she won't get out. Nobody wants a person that kills two boys out on the street. I wouldn't want her out on the street after 20, 30 years in prison. But the case continues to intrigue the public. Today, you can log on to Darley's website and get the latest information on her case. At least four books have been written about the murders. One of them, Precious Angels by crime writer Barbara Davis, is a scathing indictment of Darley Routier. Anyone who reads it will be convinced of her guilt. When I came back right to write the book, uh, I wanted it to be so certain that nobody would lose any sleep over this happening. I wanted, I was that convinced when I left the trial. But soon after it was published, Davis received new information that made her take a second look at the case. The main thing that changed my mind is when I first saw the pictures that I didn't get to see at the trial. That just, I began to get just sick, literally sick in my stomach over it. Um, because they were such important photographs. The photos are of Darley with horrendous bruises all over her arms and hands. The defense says these bruises could not have been self-inflicted, but could only have occurred in a violent struggle with an intruder. Charlie Samford, who sat on the jury, says he never saw these photos either. That one, no. This one, I might have. No, not these three I didn't see. If I had seen these during the trial, <coughs> she, um, as far as I'm concerned, she'd be home with her family right now and not where she's at. But another juror remembers seeing them. I don't know if it was while she was on the stand or if it was her husband that was on the stand, but we saw those pictures and the bruises were on the inside of her arms. Author Barbara Davis is now so convinced of Darley's innocence that she has befriended the family and gives all money made from the book to Darley's defense fund. 
For the last three years, Darley the press has also been taking a second look at the case. Like this one. In 1999, Dallas reporter Jeff Crilly from Fox station KDFW aired a four-part series on the case. When we first did this series, we were on an island. We were alone questioning whether or not she did it. And now we're finding more and more media outlets here in Dallas questioning it too. In the meantime, Darren and the family have been trying to make life as normal as possible for Drake, the only remaining son. He was seven months old when all this happened, and he's my little buddy, you know, and we are together all the time, 24 hours a day. Now get it in the hole. There you go. I see a lot of Devin and Damon in him. Yeah. He's very smart. Loves his parents very much. Doesn't really understand the situation, but knows who mommy is. And uh, is very, very close to, to Darren and to the rest of the family. Darley does see Drake, but a glass separates them. No human contact is allowed. I've missed holding him at night. I've missed singing him to sleep, giving him a bath wiping his face when it's dirty. All the things that you do when you're a mother, I've missed out on that. They've taken that from me. They've taken that from Drake. Next, Darley's fight to save her life. Okay, let's see, did you get a cookie? I did not kill my children. I stand strong in that, and I can look you in the eye, and I can look everybody else in the eye because I didn't do it. The evidence shows this. There's overwhelming evidence that proves my innocence, but they continue to ignore it. Darley Routier's life is confined within these walls at Mountain View Federal Prison in Gatesville, Texas. Isolated from the general prison population, Darley spends her time writing letters, exercising in her cell, and working at the prison sewing quilts. I'll be writing a letter to somebody or reading somebody's letter and they'll be talking about their children and going to school. You think about what would Devin and Damon look like right now? You know, how tall would they be? Damon was, um, he was just fixing to get ready to start kindergarten when this happened. And, uh, You know, you can't help from thinking about it all the time. It's with me all the time. You said to me that life would be easier if she had done it. What did you mean by that? If she had done it, I could go on. I could, I don't know, remarry, live somewhere else, not be put on camera every time someone asked me to, to try to help. It wouldn't be any helping if she had done it. You know, if she had done it, she would deserve to be where she's at. The point is, is that she didn't do it. We can prove it, and we will. Helping with their appeal every step of the way is attorney Stephen Cooper. For years, he's been discovering new information, as well as uncovering serious discrepancies from Routier's trial. There's also been progress made in identifying a bloody fingerprint on the glass coffee table in the Routier home. The uh, state's expert said the quality of the print was such that it would be of no value in trying to evaluate uh, or to identify someone with. Uh, we have since found out by other experts that there are sufficient points of identification, as they refer to it in fingerprint lingo, that yes, um, a identification could be made if uh, if we had comparable prints to compare them against. The state believed the print belonged to either Damon or Devon, but there were no means of comparison. Incredibly, the coroner never took the boy's fingerprints. In the spring of 2000, the boy's bodies were exhumed to do just that. We have since, uh, in, in the last few weeks, excluded Devon Routier as being the source of that print, and we hope in the next uh, few weeks to have uh, pretty clear evidence that it could not be Damon's either. 
Another issue is the credibility of the state's crime scene analyst, Charles Lynch, who told the court that fibers from the cut window screen were found on a kitchen knife. We've since learned that uh, this state's witness, expert, has been uh, wholly incorrect in uh, one or more other cases in his evaluation of evidence. He was uh, suffering from severe depression, alcoholism apparently, that was so bad that his own employers showed up and forcibly put him in a detox ward um, because they felt he was a danger to himself or others. But perhaps the most extraordinary turn in this case involves the court transcripts. And they're the reason why the appeal has been delayed so long. The original transcript had over 33,000 mistakes in it uh, by a court reporter who um, took the Fifth Amendment when uh, we tried to question her about her uh, preparation of this record. In court reporter Sandra Halsey's transcript, 53 pages were missing. Wrong words were used and nonverbal responses omitted. And some of the errors changed the essential facts of the case. This was only discovered when a new court reporter began reconstructing the transcripts from audio tapes that were recorded in court as backup. Diametrically different words, like the difference between yes and no, and the difference between can and cannot, and the difference between would and wouldn't. And to make matters worse, some of those audio tapes were missing. Court TV requested an interview with Halsey, but she declined. However, in an interview with Dallas reporter Jeff Crilly, Halsey had this to say. They're just typos. I looked at some of those things. They're like a missing period or a space between the end of a letter and a, and a space and then a period. Uh, I mean, there's so many just things like that. Halsey has since lost her license. The case marks the first time a capital murder trial transcript has been so riddled with errors that it is deemed inadequate to use for appeal. It's hard to believe, but uh, this court reporter acted with a degree of arrogance and callousness and total disrespect for the law as well as Darley's rights. The errors in the transcript could be Darley's entree back into the courtroom. But according to Columbia University professor James Liebman, it is very difficult to get a new trial in Texas. What we have um, determined is that the Texas court system, both in the state courts and the federal courts, is known nationally as one of the uh, least likely court systems to find and correct error in capital cases. Perhaps the routiers got a preview of just how hard it will be. On September 8, 2000, just 18 hours before a scheduled hearing over the transcript fiasco, the judge abruptly canceled it. Everything was on the docket, it was ready to go. We were supposed to be in court this morning at nine o'clock and obviously the heat's too hot. Next, will Darley ever get a new day in court? Judge Francis caved into the pressure of the DA's office and at the very last moment canceled the whole hearing. We're angry, we're upset, we, we don't understand. For two years, Judge Robert Francis had presided over a series of hearings on the transcript issue. September 8th was an important day for the routiers. Darley had been brought from prison to the Dallas jail to attend this one, at which attorney Stephen Cooper was to present new information. Sandra Halsey had told Crilly off camera that she believed Darley did it. If Cooper had presented this evidence at the hearing, it would have shown Halsey to be biased. But he never got the chance. He canceled it at the last hour uh, of yesterday. I had to hear about it through the news media. Just why that happened, no one really knows. But what it means is that the decision is now in the hands of the Criminal Court of Appeals, and no further testimony will be heard. The judge's ruling states that the transcripts now reflect what occurred at trial. Let me say that uh, I've known Judge Francis for many years and uh, this is so out of character for who I knew or at least who I thought I knew. Thank you for coming and speaking I'm, out for Darla. God Darlie. bless you and I pray for her all the time. While the fight goes on for Darley, this is her reality and this could be her future. 
death by lethal injection. But many troubling questions remain. The woman who sat across from me in that jail cell a year ago, I, either she's an Academy Award-winning actress or she didn't murder those boys. I'm very confident that upon a new trial with some of the um, information we now have um, and a little bit different approach to the trial that she'd be found not guilty and found not guilty in a very short period of time. Nothing whatsoever has changed. I mean, any, any person capable of killing a helpless five-year-old child and a six-year-old child in the manner that Darley Routier killed these two children deserves the death penalty. And those two children deserve a measure of justice, too. I have to keep fighting because I have to fight for the truth. I have to fight for Damon and Damon. I have to fight for me.